Hello there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chrysanthi Tan, you can call me Xanthi, and today's episode is based on minutes 121 through 125 of Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. This set of minutes opens with an aerial shot of 13 resistance ski speeders cruising toward the First Order battle line with red trails behind them and ends with Finn attempting to sacrifice himself for the cause. Today, I am joined by Alex Damon, also known as Star Wars Explained. This is our third attempt recording and we're gonna nail it. You killed that intro again. <laughs> I mean, you did it You did it great every single time. But <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm here all episode. So um, uh, without further ado, so much happens in these minutes. Um, I'm very excited to talk with you about the music and sound design and you know, all of the things that are happening. Um, how about we go sort of, I mean, we can sort of go in chronological order, but if there are offshoots and like tangents to go on, then we can just take little diversions along the way. Sure. Awesome. So one, this set of five minutes is really, really packed with motifs and very familiar, very familiar things. If you've been watching not only this movie, but just like, I don't know, many of the films in the Star Wars saga, especially Empire Strikes Back, I'd say. Um, we get a lot of a lot of short action cues that are sort of jam packed together. And on the soundtrack, this corresponds with Battle of Crate, which is one of the tracks at the end. That's in one of our previous attempts at recording. I think you said you counted like 12 yeah. motifs. I counted six, so I'm really interested to, <laughs> to hear the other six. I'm curious which six you heard. Okay. Uh, it starts off with March of the Resistance. That's mixed in with Rose's theme. Uh, we've got the uh, Ray's theme comes in a couple times while she's in the, the gunner seat. The TIE fighter attack from A New Hope and Return of the Jedi. Um, wait, now where, where did I get the other two from? <laughs> I may have miscounted. I may have only gotten four. No, I think... I feel like you got a couple more just because they're very obvious ones. <laughs> uh, what am I missing? What? Did... <laughs> Two, three, four. What? What obvious? There's the ones rebel am I fanfare. Missing? Oh yeah, the falcon showing up. Um, oh yeah, there's that. Then, then I think we'll... I just got five because I did have falcon written down, but I don't see anything else. To be fair, those are all the main ones. I mean, we also get a little bit of Kylo Ren. Okay. But it's um, it's a little bit. I think I actually missed that because I was listening for it. But the thing is, it it sh when it shows up, it's a little bit odd. Like the first note is changed of it, so normally it will go like do 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 do, but instead it goes like do 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 do. Huh. do. So it it does this first note double instead of you know usually the first note is a little bit higher. Um, yeah, so that that is a little bit different. And then the other ones, like I would say you got all the really main ones and the other ones are um, more incidental motifs. So they're not necessarily all ones that are attached to characters or really big ideas, but ones that are maybe pop up a lot in action sequences. But we'll get to that. It'll be it'll be grand. Uh, <laughs> so this opening shot. Wow. It's yeah just gorgeous I, I love crate and the whole idea of ryan johnson saying that you know it's a pg-13 it's a star wars movie they're not very bloody but the idea that we could get some red in there mixed in with all the action uh i i thought that that was a great idea me too me too and i f i feel like there are a lot of it reminded me of a lot of things like i feel like this scene has a lot of you know, not only rhyming, so to speak, with The Empire Strikes Back, but also just internally, like within the movie itself. And I mean, so much about this set of minutes is, you know, like with the red is not actually blood, it's actually the red dirt from the planet. And um, a lot of things are just so overtly like symbolic in this, like it, it feels very intentionally um, like part I don't know, part of the like myth and part of the whole, I don't know, everything about it is just so, I don't know. Do you know, do you kind of get what I'm saying? It's like, 
everything like a feels like, like it a has tableau. a purpose. Yeah. Yes. The, yes. Everything that's seen on the screen. I mean, that just feels like Ryan Johnson's filmmaking, uh, which I've I've only seen about half of his filmography, but from what I have seen, that just feels like he's always constantly just filling his frame with important things, whether it's right in front of you or in the background, just stuff to catch uh, upon repeat viewings. Totally. And so, like you said at the beginning, it opens with March of the Resistance. So that will be like, do, 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 And it kind of, it it does a long instance of it. Like instead of kind of ending with, it kind of keeps going upward and is like dragged out to like almost double the length. And then right after that, we get a close up of Rose touching the medallion. And of course we get Rose's theme. Um, what do you, how do you, what do you think of Rose's theme? I will, in that moment, at least, I think it, A, kind of flows from March of the Resistance really well, but I like that she's kind of touching the pendant as she's getting ready to go on an attack because it, it gives off this sense that it's not about vengeance for her or anything. She's more remembering her sister and kind of like a what page, what would Paige do? she died defending the resistance and making sure they could all continue to live on. And that's just what her goal is. Uh, just kind of like a subtle reminder that she's not in it to kill. She's in it to defend, which is mm -hmm. obviously how uh, we don't get to it in these five minutes, but that's how the scene ends uh, with her, that statement to Finn about saving what we love. So I, I just liked that moment, but um I would love to hear <laughs> your thoughts on the theme musically because I've I, I never really put a whole lot of thought into uh, the music that I'm hearing like technically, which is why I love like your show and the soundtrack show and stuff like that so much because it just it educates me on things that I never ever knew went into composing. Hmm. Oh, that's it's interesting that you phrased it that way. Um, I. A specific, uh, specifically the end part where you said what goes into composing because music is I think of it as like one more technique one more tool in the like director's toolbox and of course the composer is the person who does it but like also the director has a pretty big influence on it and in this film I mean I know Ryan Johnson had a pretty big influence on that on it as well um it's really a group effort to, uh, you know, it's it's not like the composer completely has free reign. However, John Williams does have, you know, over his 40, is it 40 years of doing Star Wars? 50 years? I mean, uh, something really absurdly long. 44, yeah. <laughs> He's developed like a sense of internal consistency. So that makes it like extra gratifying to parse through a John Williams score just because he happened, you know, he accidentally ended up building up this library of um, like thematic connections and little things that he can pull from. And he didn't mean to do that, after, you know, just going into the first film. But, you know, he has gone on the record saying that like eventually, you know, when it became clear that they were making more, like he, he just fell into that. And um, I mean, it's great for us because <laughs> there's so much, there's so much material to analyze. So Rose's theme is really interesting. Um, it's one of the main things, like I remember leaving the theater being like, whoa, there was a new theme and I can't get it out of my head. There was a, there was a new theme, oh my gosh. Rose's theme, okay. I'm doing this on my violin because my piano isn't hooked up to this uh, <laughs> situation that, that we have right now recording, but. Um, the mode of it is really related to um, it shares similarities with Yoda's theme and young Anakin's theme. And let's see, it's in the first two chords. So let's see, how can I best do this? Okay. Let's see. <laughs> So 
think of the first two chords as, okay, if you imagine Yoda's theme, it's like, do, 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 do. It kind of has that like sense of optimism and like looking up and a little bit of magic. And if you think of young Anakin's theme, it's similar. It's like, do, 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 do. harmonically, um, this is like the exact same progression. And in Rose's theme too, the beginning starts like that. Do, do. <laughs> it's so, it's, it's like would be so much easier if I were playing chords at the same time, but. Um, <laughs> do, do, do. Do. <laughs> okay, well, harmonically they're related and. I, I hear it and I believe you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and if you look into other John Williams works, you can also hear it in like the ET theme. You can also hear it in like a little bit of Jurassic Park. Um, mm. And I think it's really interesting that Rose gets that too. And also the beginning of her theme has sort of the same notes as the force theme. Do, 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 do. And the force theme would be like, do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's just like major instead of minor. So I don't know. I, I always say that Rose was probably meant to have a bigger part because she got this big theme. Like you don't create, you know, the Kaminoans don't create without a purpose. Like John <laughs> William doesn't create full on developed light motifs without a purpose. I, I wonder if, I, I think it's really interesting that, yeah, she has a theme that's similar to Yoda's and the force and not saying that she is like, you know, force sensitive in the way the Jedi is, but that she just gets it. <laughs> she gets the light side, basically. Yeah. And I think it speaks to a hopefulness about her, like an optimism and sort of um, a willing, like she's able to sort of see beyond and sort of see, you know, she's a breath of fresh air for, for Finn and for, for so many other people. I mean, on one hand, she's really rooted in this realistic upbringing and also she's able to like when she's writing the father years like she has a childlike quality about her even though she's not a child and yoda too like obviously he's not a child but he does have this like twinkle to him and you know young anakin at one point in his life mm -hmm. did too so that's rose's theme um john williams really does develop it a lot especially in his um symphonic suites but unfortunately we don't hear it at all in episode nine. We get zero roses theme, zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So after that, Poe goes, all right, ground forces lay down some fire. And then the cannons start shooting at the walkers. And here we get one of the ones that is an incidental motif and it's uh, it's called Resistance Deployed, according to the thematic cat, like the Star Wars thematic catalog that Frank Lehman put together, who's like oh. the main, like probably the biggest John Williams scholar, I would say, or especially the biggest like Star Wars films music scholar. So he's like a musicologist, music theorist. Um, and so he actually has a catalog of themes. And so the names that he gives them are his own names, but uh, because he has the most organized catalog and it has internal consistency I use his names and he knows that I use it, that I use his <laughs> names and you know they are appropriate so here's we get resistance deployed and we do hear this a lot in this film specifically in the bomber run at the beginning and this is the one that goes like do 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 yeah yeah I, I uh, gotcha <laughs> yeah <laughs> takes a while to, to settle in but um you know we usually hear it like twice in a row and it's usually like brass. Um, so we get that, but just very briefly. And then we cut to Kylo Ren and Hux watching everything from their, um, are they in an ATAT? -AT? I think they're in an ATAT. -AT. They're in his shuttle. Oh, they're in his shuttle. Okay, okay. Um, Hux says 13 incoming light craft, which I don't actually know what light means unless it means just small craft i don't know I, I think that's basically it they're just they're not like anything that's going to take a whole lot of firepower to take down 
Yeah, that makes sense. They weren't necessarily made for combat. They've been like Definitely modified. Not. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poe has just like kicked his foot through one of them and been like, what the hell? Um so that makes is, me laugh every time. I, I know. don't know why. <laughs> it is it is really funny. Um shall we hold until we clear them? Kylo's like, no, the resistance is in that mine. Um, push through. And here is where we get the Kylo Ren theme, the one that you missed. Do, 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 do. And then, oh my gosh, fill in any gaps if I'm, you know, if you have things to add. Uh, the TIE fighters swoop in and we get this sort of other thing that pops up all throughout the scene. And it's an incidental motif that's also um, in the catalog. And we also hear it, I think, toward the beginning of the film. Um, it's called like whirling, it's like a whirling octatonic motif like melody and I'll, I'll demonstrate so it's like it's this it's usually in the violins i think the xylophone often doubles it i think it's like it's like yeah and so yeah. that happens a ton and it like will go higher and lower and that's it's just like saturating the scene um and the octatonic thing is just refers to like the octatonic scale that it shared that it uses um and so we get that pose like fighters break I, off i'll oh. point out that i really love this isn't musical at all but it's sound design there's just like this really distinct noise that the tie fighter blasts make when they're hitting the the ground near where like all the resistance is entrenched and i just i love that noise every time i think that's i think bonnie wilde came up with that but um the sound design is incredible in the crate scene and like i was watching um some of the sound people talk to i think uh, it was like an interview with the dolby institute and the dolby institute interviewer was like you know what scenes you know for our customers or whatever that have the dolby sound system which parts of the movie would you recommend they pay you know special like which ones will be like the most gratifying and um you know other than the entire movie, they pointed out the Battle of Crate is like, if you have the Dolby sound system, apparently you can hear, you know, things coming from above you and like all of the detail coming from different places. And that makes me kind of want that. But um, the sound designers had a real, it was kind of a treat for them to work on this film because the music was done so far in advance. So they were able to craft the sound design around the score, hmm. which is really I, I did not handy. Know that. I thought uh, music was generally like one of the last things done. Not when you're John Williams. I think it was one of his <laughs> like stipulations that he wanted an entire year. So cool. he had a whole year, he had a whole year to write this. Cause like John Williams literally like, writes pen like pencil to paper every note which is um exceedingly like i don't know anyone i don't know any of any other composers that do that and so that takes a, that takes a lot of time obviously yeah um and he does most of it himself and you know he doesn't use the computer like, he doesn't use computers he never really figured out how to do that and you know he's always been so busy that he didn't really have time to like set aside a right. couple years to retool his whole workflow so it's really funny that he still that he still does that um and he wanted to enjoy the process and you know do his best work and i think it's i think it's um a really phenomenal score but the reason that comes in handy is because the sound design and the score there's like an intricate balance between them and the dialogue there's an intricate balance and they have to fight for frequency space. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful if you know that like, you know, the whirling octatonic thing is kind of high pitched. So you're not gonna like create sound design that lives in that same frequency range because then it'll get lost. You won't hear either one. You'll just hear kind of a lot happening. So then you might huh. introduce things that are in maybe the mids or the lows or, you know, different textures. So it's really so collaborative. That, that like that stuff that I would never even 
it would never cross my mind that people would have to worry about that. I mean, I'm, I'm someone that every year when the Academy Awards come around, I have to Google the difference between sound editing and mixing just to <laughs> remind myself. So that's that's yeah. super interesting to think about. Yeah, and oftentimes, like the composer, um, oftentimes the composer will have direction from, um, you know, the per, the editors or the mixers or you know some other music supervisor people, and they'll be told like, you know, you have to take out some of your instrumentation here or whatever. But it's a little bit different when you're working with John Williams. So <laughs> they kind of worked around him and. While they did, you know, take him, take his score down in the mix, and of course, there's he's subject to cutting just like any other, any other composer is. They were able to um, pay attention to what is John Williams choosing in the instrumentation and in the themes that he's bringing out. It's like which emotions is he honoring in the scene, and like which fears is he playing into. And I think, I mean, I think that's just a really um, cool part of the process that I don't always think about, which is, I mean, each person that adds their own like art to the film has their own interpretation that they're sort of adding to it. And the uh -huh. music is no different. That, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so moving on, we have a lot of explosions and stuff. Um, Finn is like, Rose, you've got, you've got three behind you. And then the death trooper fires at Rose and Mrs. And she says, I can't lose them, which is kind of funny. Um, she glances back and here we get another, uh, we get the tension, we get one of the tension themes. And this is also very present in the bomber run. Like, you know, there are a lot of similarities between this and the bomber run, to be honest, um, probably on purpose. And that's yeah. the do, 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 that's what that is. Um, <laughs> and God, there's so many motifs. Uh, I mean, can't get my notes straight. Um, okay, then the Millennium Falcon appears behind her. And we get again the do, 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 which is the resistance deployed. Is that is that before the the rebel motif comes in? Yes, right before it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, I'm telling you, they're like one after another. They're just like, I don't know, <laughs> slide it in there, slide it in there. And it's like two seconds of one, two seconds of another. Um, like for me, this five minutes goes by very slowly if I'm trying to listen to for the motifs, because it's like, wait, two seconds in, I have to pause and write one another one down. <laughs> um, and then finally, we get the Rebel fanfare. And of course, it's the Falcon which I love ju just that silhouette going over, like immediately gives you chills. And then, yeah, I'm coupled with the, the rebel fanfare. It's like, love that. Yeah. Um, he, he has earned that. Um, I, like it, it works because we love it. That's why it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we get Ray's theme, another one that feels familiar by this point. Um, and she's like, I like this. I feel like that's been a meme. Um, Almost certainly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like that was in the Star Wars Lego holiday special or something. I don't know. I just have this. <laughs> yeah, it has a meme -y quality to it. And then we get Ray's theme interspersed with that like xylophone violin thing, the whirling thing. And here, like, there are so many scene cuts. And with each, I mean, like scene I guess cuts transitions and with each one the music sort of changes a little bit so if you notice like whenever it moves to the first order side of things like the instrumentation immediately switches to like low brass or you know things that are sound more ominous um and it happens like so seamlessly so it cuts to kylo and it's immediately low brass and then when we go back it's the rebel fanfare again Oh, <laughs> and this, yeah, this feels like all, I don't know, separate clips, but he just composed it to be that way and to like cut back and forth along yeah. with the movie. Yeah. And, um, you know, there was an interview that he did 
where he was saying that like modern films, you can't get away with using with doing so much of the leitmotif writing anymore because just the filmmaking, the scoring style has changed so much. Like now it's a lot more about textures and and other things. And plus there's not much motivation to like develop leitmotifs just because of the way things are cut so fast and, and mm. whatnot. And he feels lucky that he gets to have so much fun with Star Wars because it's set up in such this like old school leitmotif like Wagnerian way and he said that on this film he had a lot of fun just like getting to throw in little references here and there and he says in the interview like maybe you know people won't pick up on it the first time but like I like to think that it's there and subtly influencing you know what people are taking in so yeah I think this was just him being like I made all these themes I'm gonna put them all in <laughs> where I want them <laughs> I mean um, it's, it's wild that just the same song has so many I'm, I'm trying to I don't know if I've ever listened to this part of the movie just the music but it it seems like it might be a little jarring musically to just bounce back and forth but have you it, it never feels jarring in the movie have you seen the score only version uh I think I did I, I did when it first came out on blu-ray so it's been three years okay it's on disney plus now and um i i think it's it's wild how much this scene actually really makes sense with the score only version just because it's scored so tightly to the action and you know i found it i find it easier to hear the score that way without the sound design and then to add that layer is like just um i don't know it's just even more rewarding to hear it all together but this is one of you those you may have been asked this already because we're near the end of this movie but do you know or have a, any idea why they did the score only version like for this movie and that because that ryan johnson doesn't... wanted it yeah he yeah it was a ryan johnson choice huh it's just interesting that that doesn't happen more often i agree no but ryan johnson was like such a big fan of you know, he just loves John Williams so much and, you know, has like a really um, reverence for the music that he, they, like, they had to mix a whole separate version. Like, it's a whole, um, yeah, that was like important to him. So, huh. yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wish they did it for more of them. That would be really cool. I, but, yeah, I agree. <laughs> but yeah, alas. Um, so, where were we? Where were we? Okay, so Rebel Fanfare, Chewy, whirling on, <laughs> what's the next thing? Okay, back to the First Order. Kylo's like, blow that piece of junk out of the sky. And then we get the other tension, resistance and trouble theme, which is like, do 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 um, Ray's theme again. And then we get this catastrophe theme. <laughs> so many, so many themes. <laughs> And so the catastrophe one is interesting. It's like everything slows down and it's like do, 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 do. that's the one I've been waiting for. Is is this the the theme that Oh <laughs> that, okay. that's the one in my head I was like, okay, I can think like, of that. This one. has gotta be something, but Right. Okay, so that's catastrophe. Yes, yes, yes. And you know, it, it is a little bit reminiscent of the Battle of Hoth. And speaking of which, then we get the TIE fighter attack uh, do, 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 uh, theme that comes next. And this part, so this is when like the Falcon is shot and they enter the, I wrote the Star Tours portion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they like it barrel rolls um, down like a crevice into the like stalagmites, it, like this rift. And I mean, if you've ever been on the Star Tours ride at, at Disney World or, or Disneyland, this is like classic Star Tours. It's straight up like they use this. They they use this music in Star Tours. They use the um you know the Empire Strikes Back music, and you basically fly like through, um, you know through the crystal. What is it like the crystal caves and mm -hmm. the Falcon sort of does that. It slides through the slit. I don't know. It's like a whole. It was an intentional reference, apparently. Um, I mean, it it definitely fits. Like I a I love that song. I like can't help but hum along to it anytime it pops up, but it, it does. The scene is obviously you're being attacked by TIE fighters, 
But then I think the other time they use it is in Return of the Jedi when they're flying into the Death Star. And uh, and correct me if I'm wrong oh. there, but like that whole, it, it just feels similar where you're flying through a tight space being chased by TIE fighters. So he's just like, yeah, we'll use that again. It's already a banger. It, that's, yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> um, so what can go wrong when you have that? And then the Rebel fanfare right after that. Um, and then the Falcon just shoots out like a geyser. And it's quite a sight to be seen, um, just shooting out from, you know, underneath, straight up into the sky. Um, Chewie pushes a Porg <laughs> out of the way. <laughs> and um, then the resistance speeders start closing in on the cannon. And this is when, I think this is like when Poe shows a big moment of growth here. And, you know, Rose is like, there it is, that's a big gun. And we get really low, you know, low, um, brassy stuff. That's like, I don't know, big gun music. And <laughs> Finn is like, I know what this is. Like, he kind of feels like this is his moment. And, you know, the, he's like, the cannon's opening. This is our chance. Um, and then meanwhile, Kylo's like, all oh, firepower on those speeders. And, you know, Kylo gives Hux a really hilarious look when Hux just repeats him, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and this is when the Resistance are starting to realize, like, oh, I think we're in over our heads here. Um, something that the music does here is when we see, like, each of the speeders exploding in, like, a, I don't know, red dust or I don't know what's happening, but um, the music swells and then sort of does this like puncture as each of them happen. So it's mm. like boop, boop, and it's timed to like when each of the speeders like explodes and it's like a little crescendo. It's like a swell until that. It's like, yeah, if you go back um, huh. and watch that, it's like, there's like two of them. And it's and the music like perfectly scores that. I've never noticed that. I think I just assumed it was part of the sound design. Oh, <laughs> the, the, interesting. The explosions. Well, it's probably both. So like the music does that and the sound design, you know, augments it. Right. With, yeah. Um, which happens a lot in this in the score. I mean in Star Wars, but in this score too. Like another big one is like when the Praetorian guards earlier do their like, they're like, mm. I don't know, slice thing. You kind of hear yeah. like the knife, you kind of hear like the sound design, but also in the score, there's something emulating that at the same time. Right. Um, layers. <laughs> um, here we cut to Leia. She's like, after, you know, we're, we're taking heavy losses and Leia gives this look and I think I hear a hint of what is Kylo Ren's second theme, like his hesitant one. And that one is like, dee -dee 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 -dee. Mm -hmm. and so we get those same four notes. Um, and I don't know if that's huh. intentional or if it's a coincidence or if it's, I don't know, just there's some emotional similarity um, or maybe it's like a mother son reference. I'm not sure. so. That's just something I heard, but it might be an accident. Who knows? Um, back on the outside, Poe's racing toward the cannon. We keep hearing that xylophone string thing. Um, Poe says, they're picking us all off. We're not going to make it. And Finn says, all right, making my final approach. Target in sight. Guns are hot. And then Poe's like, no, pull off. And this is Poe showing his moment of growth. Um, here it's really interesting because we see that Poe is like going for it. Rose and Poe, I mean, sorry, Finn is really going for it. Rose and Poe are like, no retreat, pull away. And Finn is like, no, this is, this is my moment. And the music here shifts so dramatically. Um, is that something, what do you make of that? Yeah, just uh, that this is basically where 
the minute ends is like right at the start of like the choir coming in, I guess. Mm-hmm. And just the Finn, I don't, I don't know what to call it, Finn's sacrifice or, uh, it definitely made me think. I remember in the theater being like, oh my God, they're about to kill Finn. Uh, and I, I think the music probably had something to do with that because it feels very sacrificial, maybe. Yeah. I would agree with that. I think the music is really um, trying to make us feel that this is actually going to happen. Because, well, a few things. First of all, that music sort of reminds me of like the immolation of Anakin in Revenge of the Sith. Mm. And hearing that sort of slowed down strings and choir thing, just to me, um, you know, not just to me, but in cinema, and it often symbolizes, you know, death, like it's like Requiem like it's like um, doom, and, you know, the end and sacrifice and and things like that. And I think really, like the cinematography sort of emulates that as well, like, because both perspectives, like the musically, and just the close up that we see on his face, like with the camera work, it both switches to like, okay, now let's just focus zero in on zero in on Finn. And this is all, this is what's going on inside of Finn's head. Like all of that music that we've been hearing before that action stuff, all of that is still presumably going on outside of Finn's, you know, cockpit. But now we are suddenly in this, this little world. And it's sort of like also when Paige at the beginning, like when yeah. she's about to sacrifice herself, we do get like a close up on her experience and the music, you know, becomes very um, particular to what Paige is going through. And it's also like that epic, like, you know, like, you know, end of the world for this one person. And yeah, Finn sort of starts to have that page moment. Huh. I never, never put that together. But yeah, the filmmaking and the music of just really focusing in on that one, one person, and like you can kind of see uh, the stuff going around outside of Paige's ship or we'll cut to Poe or Captain Kennedy, but like we don't hear any of that. Exactly. Uh, it never brings us out of Paige. That's that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's manipulative. Music is um, <laughs> it's another resource to convey the story, which, you know, I, I mean, I love film. Make, I love film. I love the collab- I love how collaborative like all the different art forms are. Um, this, I mean, the bomber run similarities are plentiful in this scene. We have the resistance (laughs) in over their heads. They're trying to take out a big piece of equipment, whether it's like a dreadnought or this, you know, big ion cannon. We have individual heroes trying to step up and show their willingness to sacrifice. So that's Paige. And we see that mirrored with Finn. Um, and but resistance shows growth. Like this time Poe doesn't want to sacrifice someone just to take out a dreadnought. Mm -hmm. This time he, you know, thinks it's better to retreat. And, you know, Rose also steps up because she saves, you know, she finally gets to save what she loves. And then I think shot wise, you know, we see Paige touching the medallion. We see Rose touching the medallion, the Paige Finn thing. I just think, I feel like this is like intentional, intentional rhyming here. Musically, a lot of the themes, same themes pop up, like all these tension and catastrophe and resistance mm-hmm. deployed themes are stuff that we hear during the bomber run. Um, yeah. And I, I think one of the big differences here is that, you know, the resistance had a, a place to escape at, at the start when they were escaping to car. Now they don't. So, you know, even if uh, they, they hit the cannon, that's just a delay. And so it, it's good to know that, yeah, like it's good to see Poe's growth, that it's not worth it just to just to hit him where it hurts. Um, but like Finn still needing that one little last literal push <laughs> to get it. Yeah, and I think they do a good job conveying the actual desperation of this moment, which sets the stage more for when um, Luke, you know, makes his appearance. But um, here I think... What am I trying to say? There's 
So Finn shows growth, Rose shows growth, the resistance as a movement sort of do, but also they're really let down that no one answers Leia's call. <laughs> um, I remember being in the theater just thinking like, um, well, this is awkward. Like what is happening? What is gonna happen? Um, <laughs> how are we gonna get out of this? And I think that's something I also probably felt during Empire Strikes Back, though I didn't see that in the theater, but um, I kind of get a similar, um, I mean, at this point, thinking that this would be the end of the movie, like I sort of had this similar, like, oh, I guess we're really screwed. But um, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself, obviously, that's not what ends up happening at the end of the movie. I feel like this has a much, um, I feel like this has kind of an ending. I feel like this has um, not a to be continued <laughs> nature to it, but um, I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh, something that I think is really um, classic is like the first order versus resistance. They're like fighting techniques and just like the things that they employ to defend each other and I mean, not defend each other to defend themselves and attack the other is like the first order slash empire are always going to have just like some big weapon, some big thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whether it's like 500 death stars or it's like, of course it's a really, really big gun. Just yeah. Really <laughs> Miniaturized death star tech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'd like to get your take on all of the various like abandoned bases that the rebellion have and the resistance all over the galaxy. Uh, even just the fact that they exist or. Yeah. Like, why do you think, why do you think that is? And do you think they're always destined to be this like really ragtag desperate operation? Uh, well, I think that when it comes to why there are bases scattered around, because you know, they all started out before it was a rebel alliance. They were all just rebel cells and they were all just hiding around. So Crate was just a place that they used to hide. I had the, the Leia Princess of Alderaan book uh, showed us that like Bail Organa, it was a pretty major one because Bail Organa and Mon Mothma knew about it. Um, but I think that people that weren't even like, like the people on Lothal and Star Wars Rebels, that was just another cell that was fighting against the empire, but not as an organized movement. So I think that all across the galaxy, especially in the outer rim, you can find just these places where a few people probably hung out and plotted and planned against the empire. Uh, so they probably just know where all those places are if they ever need another place to hide. Uh, and I forget the second part of the question. Me too, but I, f I feel like the same, like I was thinking about like why does it always feel like they're bootstrapping something and like just oh, in a right. desperate situation? And I had been, I, like, I have been thinking, especially after the Last Jedi novelization that really explained why Snoke really wanted to, you know, live on the supremacy and have that be like their mobile operations that they, because of the danger of just like being in one place, like, you know, once someone discovers your, discovers your base, like you have to move on. And that's just the life. That's like the life of, resistance and of, you know, fighting the power, I guess. Um, but these little, what you said about like the little cells, like that is also very true. Like it's not always one organized rebellion with, you know, a clear cut leader. It's like, it's resistance. It's not just like two random political groups. It's like mm -hmm. people resisting oppression across the galaxy. And that just, that resistance just springs up in really organic ways in different places. So it's going to be harder to, to be, you know, organized about it. Yeah. Well, uh, your, your question about, are they destined to always be just a ragtag group of underdogs? I think in the immediate future, I mean, the rise of Skywalker was like, okay, the galaxy is finally saying like, no, we're not going to just let the small group of heroes save us. And we'll just sit back and wait. Like the galaxy as a whole, came to attack Exegol. So I think at least for now, the, I mean, the first order is probably gone, but the galaxy seems pretty united in that front. But I figure that if we were to jump 
hundreds of years into the future, there'd probably be some new level of complacency uh, where if another threat came up, like they'll, they'll just go, ah, we'll let the heroes handle that. And we'll just sit back. <laughs> that, that kind of seems like the cycle. It does seem like the cycle. And it seems like the cycle that it's like futile to try to escape it because like it, the whole thing runs on like balance and the tension and, and all, and you know, all of those moving parts, you know, you can't have, can't have things all perfect. Um, do you have any, can you name all of the people fighting in this battle? Just oh, curious. absolutely not. <laughs> uh, what are the, who are the main resistance people? Outside of, uh, outside of po, like the po main and cast. Rose, uh, Kai Thranali is the Abednado pilot. I don't think I know any of the other pilots. Is in that the this one that's Mark Hamill's son? No, that's Manau. Uh, okay. that's, that's Nathan Hamill who I've met multiple times and is super fun. Uh, super nice guy. Uh, so yeah, all of Mark Hamill's family, uh, is in that base, or all of his children. Uh, I believe they're all named Manau because Nathan's character in Revenge of the Sith, I think, uh, had that last name. So they just kind of kept that going as an Easter egg, as if. Oh, I didn't uh, know he was in Revenge of the Sith. Alive. Hmm? I didn't know he was in Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, I think so. He's definitely in one of the prequels. Oh, that's cool. Uh, you can you can find like a picture of him looking much younger in like this uh, purple robe or something. I nice. think he's on Coruscant somewhere. Nice, fancy, very fancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a, do you have a favorite Tie Fighter? Oh. I think I've always been partial to the interceptor. Okay. I like the, you know, the angular wings with the cut mm -hmm. out of them. Uh, that tends to be my favorite. I, I'm partial to the Tie Phantom as well. It's like the old Legends one that it, it's able to go invisible and cloak. But oh, uh, <laughs> that that was from like an old silly video game that I just grew up loving. Oh, what was the video game? Rebel Assault Two. Okay. Okay. Cool. I didn't play that, but um, I don't recognize it from. from it books. does not hold up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not all of not all of Legend stuff does for me, but some of it does. Um, what? Let's see. Do I have any? Oh, do you have any favorite musical themes in Star Wars? I do love the Tie Fighter attack, but the probably the asteroid field in oh. empire i love that one everyone loves duel of the fates because come on but i think the asteroid field like every time i'm watching that i just turn it up real loud okay so the asteroid field is like is a really good example of a set piece theme in star wars and this would be that too like the battle of crate is also mm -hmm. an example of a set piece theme and um that just means like an extended action sequence, you know, often really heavily detailed scoring, like, you know, like the Battle of Crate, packed with like motifs here and there. And those are like, those are really, I find that those are really standout pieces in fans mind, especially like the asteroid field, because mm -hmm. when you think of it, you immediately go to that specific instance of it because it's like you know set piece themes are often just like very so specific and so reminiscent of where they first appeared and like are so almost like bespoke for that scene in the way that they're put together so like it's not like when you hear the force theme you could that could be from any movie right it's huh yeah it's like really um a really direct connection and i find that makes it like really emotionally strong for things like that and I mean, I, I love those. I love those pieces. Those, those pieces. They're just uh, the asteroid field is just. Yeah, that's interesting to like. And then I think back to okay, well, what are my like? I love the trench run. Uh, that's another example. Hope. But it, but it took me a second to think of what that music sounds like, mm. uh, which I just think that's interesting. Mm. Where the asteroid field is just so <laughs> it, it immediately you know what it is. Yeah, you're not like a lot of people share that sentiment and so do I and I who knows like what what things um 
impact that. But there are a lot of John Williams set piece themes in Star Wars, and a lot of them are quite, quite memorable. And, you know, scholars have like a field day analyzing those ones, um, just because they're so rich with motifs. And I think I don't know, I feel like I like to think that he has fun with those. They seem fun. Um, and <laughs> this is a great example of that. Let's see. Did you have anything else to add about this scene or Star Wars music in general? I know you're a big trivia person. Is there ever music trivia on these things? Oh, uh, generally no, but I'm trying, there's gotta be. Really? Off the top of my head, I can't think of like any musical trivia. I'm sure that there's something in my head, but <laughs> not off the top of my head, no. And I think we covered everything that I wrote down in my notes. Awesome. I'm surprised there should, mm, that would be a stumper. Okay, wait. It's, it's one of those where like, the second you ask me, I'm not going to be able to think of anything. But uh, <laughs> someday later, like tonight, I'll be talking with Molly and just a piece of musical trivia will come out of my mouth. <laughs> okay, wait, here's one. Um, what's the first film that the Imperial March appears in? It's Empire, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ooh, I, I think you'll know it. But what's the first scene that features the Imperial March? Oh. Not necessarily the the full thing, but the 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 motif of it, I guess. I don't know, off the top of my head. What is it? Uh it's the very first scene when it after the crawl it pans down to the Star Destroyer and it's oh. just a very quiet like da 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 very Oh, like, a slow, slow. like in slow oh that's a good one that's a really good that's, one thank you to the soundtrack show let's <laughs> see nice. i just stole my trivia from well David you w. have to Collins. learn it from somewhere uh -huh. <laughs> okay well here's the last jedi specific one okay what is the john williams non-star wars reference that's in this film like a musical oh, quote wow. uh I'm trying to think if I can make an educated guess on. I'll guess that it is somewhere on Canto Bite. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can get more specific. I'm trying to like maybe the Fathers, maybe the. I I'll say the very first introduction to them going into the casino. No, but okay. I'm but I'm impressed that you went to, jumped to Canto Bite. So it is actually like right before the Father Years bust in and you see the glass shake uh -huh. and you hear this like lounge piano music. Okay. <laughs> that lounge piano music is The Long Goodbye, which is like a film John Williams scored. That's awesome. <laughs> and John Williams himself is playing the piano. Also awesome. Yeah, I had <laughs> And then the drum that bangs is his brother. <laughs> So I, I never it's like a John ever, Williams, uh, a Williams brothers duet right there. That's awesome. I never, ever would have known that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a really random um, thing that Ryan Johnson really wanted. He was like, I love your score for the long goodbye. And I would really like that song there. So that's it, hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is pretty funny. Um, so, okay. Now, now that we're at the end of the episode, I always review the motifs. So let me just list out the motifs. These will also be in the show notes. Um, it's March of the Resistance, Rose, Resistance Deployed, the Kylo Ren's aggressive theme, the whirling octatonicism, generic tension, rebel fanfare, Ray's main theme, resistance and trouble tension, catastrophe, TIE fighter attack, and potentially Kylo Ren's hesitant theme. That's a lot. And we are on Battle of Crate, that's on the soundtrack. And um, highly recommend watching this five minutes, actually like this seven minutes at least, um, on the on the score only version if you have access to that on Disney Plus because it's so it's so detailed. It's it's a very it's very detailed here. I think I think it's really incredible. Thank you so much, Alex, for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for teaching me. I'm excited that I now know that that thing is called catastrophe. <laughs> 
I'm gonna yeah. I have more stuff to annoy Molly with. I'm gonna hit her be like, it's that's catastrophe right there. And that's <laughs> resistance and distress. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um if people don't already know where to find you online, where can they find you online? Uh, our YouTube channel is Star Wars Explained, where we talk about all of the new movies and TV shows and books and comics and game, anything that's coming out Star Wars, we try to cover it. And we're on Twitter at Star Wars Explained with no ED. Uh, yeah, those are the, the two main places, I'd say. Yeah. Also, I noticed that you have a TIE Fighter, like an every TIE Fighter video. Oh, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I definitely looked at that last night. I'll put a link to that in the show notes for people who are interested in all the different TIE fighters, which by the way, they all have like different sounds too, like different elephant noises and car screeches <laughs> and stuff. Um, I hope this episode was interesting for people. Um, you can find me online at Star Wars Museman on Twitter. If you are listening to this as a podcast, you can also watch it on YouTube and vice versa. If you're watching on YouTube, but prefer it as a podcast, you can find it as a podcast. You can leave a comment or email me at podcast at Star Wars Music Minute if you have something to say or, you know, I'm all all ears for corrections as well. At the end of the season, I do want to do a um, like things I missed episode with, you know, any corrections to things that I said that may have been wrong, like a fact check episode, basically. And you can also find me at Chris Anthony Tan on Twitter or Instagram or anywhere. And Last but not least, there's a link in the show notes if you want to submit an anonymous question on a form. But um, that's all I have for today. We're almost done with the movie. Exciting times. And I'll see you next week on Star Wars Music Minute.